Good afternoon, everyone. We're starting to see the participants become uh, active in our presentation today. Let's take a few moments and let everyone join us. Maybe just a few more moments. Okay, we're excited about the great turnout today. Let's go ahead and begin. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. I am Bruce Reinig and I am the interim Thomas and Evelyn Page Dean of the Fowler College of Business at San Diego State University. Welcome to our President's Lecture Series in conjunction with the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs. We are excited and honored to host Ambassador Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa, and he will be making opening remarks followed by a conversation with me on current events. But first, it is my honor to introduce San Diego State University President Dr. Adala De La Torre. Dr. De La Torre became the ninth permanent president of SDSU in June of 2018. She brings nearly 30 years of service and leadership roles within institutions of higher education and is committed to student success. Under her direction, the university will pursue the highest levels of teaching, research, innovation, and collaboration excellence focusing on graduating exceptional global citizens, compassionate leaders, and ethical innovators who impact the San, Di San Diego community and the world at large. Please join me in welcoming President Adela De La Torre. Thank you, Bruce. I welcome all of you to the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs President's Lecture Series featuring our esteemed guests, His Excellency, Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States of America. I would also like to take this time to thank Chenya Hostler, Ambassador Charles Hostler's widow, who has been a constant champion of these vital activities, both through her influence and compassion-driven philanthropy. Discussions like these are important because they put our emphasis on merging outstanding leadership and situations that make history and history in the making of today's world affairs. At this time, I want to share a brief history and significance of the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs. The Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs plays a critical role in the educational mission of SDSU. It was founded in 1942 as the Institute on World Affairs to inform students, faculty, and the wider public on global affairs. Guided by the operating motto, let the other side be heard, the Institute has provided SDSU and the greater San Diego community with high level and spirited intellectual engagement on a diversity of international issues. The Institute has hosted distinguished speakers from around the world that have included ambassadors, Nobel laureates, and world leaders. The center now bears the name of Charles W. Hostler, former U.S. Ambassador to Bahrain. Ambassador Charles Hostler endowed the Institute in 2004. Now, Chenye Hostler, who, will hear, who we will hear from in a moment, is working tirelessly to carry on his legacy of distinction and goodwill. Born and raised in Taiwan, Mrs. Hostler moved into the United States to pursue higher education. She started out at Columbia University, but relocated to San Diego, where she attended and graduated from San Diego State University. After working for large financial companies for many years, Mrs. Hostler established an important import-export business 
which offered many opportunities to grow her passion for global diplomacy, commerce, and travel. By her own account, she has traveled to more than 150 countries. Please join me in welcoming a visionary leader who seeks to make the world a better place, Chinye Hostler. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Ambassador. It's wonderful to see you again. We're honored and delighted that you will be giving the presentation at the Joint President and Charles Hustler Institute of War Affairs Lecture Series. The Hustler Institute supports course work and activities surrounding international diplomacy, global business, student travel abroad, student scholarships, and international research. The Institute will be celebrating its 80th year, that's 8-0, in spring 2022. That's only a year and a half from now. When my late husband, Charles, was the U.S. Ambassador to Bahrain during the Gulf War, he established a close friendship with your benevolent leader, Sheikh Issa. Due to Charles' significant contribution to both countries, he received the highest award from Bahrain and U.S. State Department. At the end of the Gulf War, Charles was instrumental in installing the U.S. Fifth fleet base in Bahrain after initiating the signing of the Defense Cooperation Agreement. Sheikh Issa didn't want to lose contact with Charles, so he offered Charles the honorary Consul General position in the U.S., in fact, the only one in the world. Charles proudly promoted trade, investment, and tourism for 21 years until his passing in 2014. Thank you again for being here, Mr. Ambassador. We're excited to learn more about the many Bahrain and U.S. ties today. And speaking as an SDSU alum, I look forward to the opportunity for collaboration between the University of Bahrain and SDSU. Thank you. Thank you, Chenye. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, His Excellency, Excellency Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States of America, began his professional career at the Royal Court where he directed educational, medical, and social affairs. Shortly after, he joined the General Organization for Youth in Sports, taking on roles as a Director of Planning and Follow-up and Director of Financial and Human Resources. In 2010, he was appointed Governor of the Southern Government of the Kingdom of Bahrain, where he launched a partnership with the American nonprofit organization there to deploy an anti-violence an anti-addiction program delivered by trained community police officers in local and secondary schools. It is now a nationally recognized program sponsored by the Kingdom's National Anti-Drug Committee. His work also included involvement in drafting the National Anti-Drug Strategy in conjunction with the Regional Office of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Sheikh Abdullah, has served in a variety of volunteer roles, including a member of the Bahrain Olympic Committee, Vice President of the Bahrain Olympic Shooting Federation, and Vice President of the Asian Shooting Confederation. In 2016, he was granted an Honorary Distinction Award, recognizing his gubernatorial achievements and contributions. Additionally, he received the prestigious Stevie Award for his role in the founding and development of the Man Together Program Against Violence and Addiction. Prior to his professional career, Sheikh Abdullah attended college in Massachusetts, where he graduated with an undergraduate and graduate degree in business administration 
from Bentley University. On June 30th, 2017, His Majesty King Hamad bin Isi Al Khalifa appointed Sheikh Abdullah bin uh, Rashid uh, as ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States of America. Please celebrate with me as we honor His Excellency, Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa, and present him with our SDSU Presidential Medallion. And now, a warm welcome to His Excellency, Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa. President Delatore, thank you so much for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Hostler, Dean Rennig, thank you very much for having me today at San Diego State University. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with your students and your faculty. And I so look forward to this conversation. Mrs. Holster, thank you for your continued efforts on behalf of the Bahrain-US bilateral relationship. Your husband was an invaluable asset to the bilateral relationship, more impactful over his long tenure of service that I can possibly state here. Please know that your house and your family has a wonderful name throughout my kingdom where people look upon your family with the highest respect and regard. Dean Rennick, thank you for doing this. I look forward to our conversation. I'm very excited by the questions that you might have in mind. Before we get into that though, uh, I thought that I'll take a moment to just explain the extent of the relationship between our two nations. Uh, Although our formal relations only date back to 1971, the story of our two lands actually goes back over a century ago when Christian missionaries came to Bahrain in 1983 and established a medical facility, which would grow to become the American Mission Hospital that is still in operation today and has actually expanded into two other locations. It was your American staple, Standard Oil, out of California that set up Bahrain Petroleum Company, Babco, in 1929 before any other oil company was established in the region. Then on the heels of Babco's founding, the missionaries beginning to understand the true open and inclusive mindset of Bahrainis founded the American Mission School in 1930, one of the first such Western schools in the region. Throughout World War II, Bahrain remained not only a friend to the Allied forces, but actively harbored Jewish citizens from throughout the region, providing shelter and safety as they were having a hard time to find a home in the region. In fact, Bahrain was so collaborative with the Allies and played such a supporting role for the United States that in 1947, the naval support activity Bahrain was established, which has since grown into the headquarters of your Navy's fifth fleet. In the following decades, the naval support activity was converted to the home port of the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet, and both the American Mission Hospital and the Missionary School flourished. Trade ties grew in areas of not only oil, but shipping, metals, and other textiles. In 1991 was when the Defense Cooperation Agreement was signed, as Mrs. Holster clearly stated. In 2002, 
President George W. Bush became um, the president who designated Bahrain as a major non-NATO ally and became the first president to visit Bahrain in 2003. In the year 2006, Bahrain signed a free trade agreement with the United States, which helped drive our economies closer together. We have since seen an uptick in trade between the two countries. In the past 10 years, Bahrain was able to double its exports to the United States, whereas the United States was able to triple its exports to Bahrain. Many things happened as years went by, but I think one of the important milestones came in the year 2017 when His Royal Highness the Crown Prince visited Washington. On that trip, His Royal Highness signed multiple deals, adding up to $11 billion worth of deals in different industries. And maybe that number is not as big as it is, but it's half our GDP that we're pushing to the United States, showing a quick commitment to the longstanding and strong relationship that we have built. I'm sure that there are many questions that you would like to ask, especially in light of many new developments in the Middle East, and I will be happy to answer them as we commence this evening. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for that overview of the history of the relations between Bahrain and the United States. Um, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to ask you some questions about some recent events. And may I begin by uh, asking you about something we've heard a great deal of in the news lately, that is the Abraham Accords Declaration. Would you please provide us an overview of these accords? Absolutely. I mean, we are living in unprecedented times. And I think that the recent announcement of Bahrain joining the Accords is truly a historic moment for us. It all started out in the beginning of the year when the U.S. president announced a peace plan. That peace plan needed to see steps forward. And in response to the plan, we saw Israeli Prime Minister pursue annexation of 30% of the West Bank, which is allocated to Israel in the new peace plan. And so from our perspective, we thought that something needed to be done to further ensure safety and stability in the region. And as a result, the Abrahams Accords were announced where the UAE would establish relations in exchange for a suspension of further annexation. That was formally announced on August 13th, and our announcement came nearly a month later. There was a signing ceremony at the White House two months ago on September 15th. and we saw our foreign minister address the American people from the South Lawn. It was a truly inspiring moment where we've seen the establishment of uh, those relations with the state of Israel. Going back in time, the last time that that happened was back in 1994 when Jordan announced and before them, Egypt in 1979 also announced a similar step. But from 1994 up until 2020, um, there were a lot of initiatives that were presented, but unfortunately those initiatives were stagnant. And so we are very happy that uh, the country has and the leadership 
in both those countries have taken bold steps in unlocking new potential, unlocking opportunities, op creating hope within a region that has for many years uh, suffered the consequences of uh, unrest. And we're very hopeful and we're very optimistic that in the days, months, and years to come, we will establish stronger relations leading to peace, not only in the immediate region, but also creating a ripple effect for other parts of the world as well. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, may I ask, how do the Abrahams Accords affect the daily lives of the citizens of Bahrain and Israel? And what are your most hopeful aspirations to result from these accords? And what progress have you seen thus far? That's a very good question. Uh, the, the biggest way, in my opinion, that the accords will affect the daily lives of our citizens is that it fosters the people-to-people -people relationship. And I think that the fostering of the people-to-people -people relationships is the backbone for any healthy relationship going forward. It allows for a change in the old mindset that we as Arabs do not engage with, uh, with uh, those from the Jewish faith or with Israelis to really change. And so um, for, for, this, for, for those of, uh, that have joined us today, uh, it, it's very important to note that uh, Bahrain is uh, one of the only countries in the region that has and always historically has had an indigenous Jewish community within the society living harmoniously. And uh, actually in 2017, there was an interfaith civil society group called This is Bahrain that traveled to Jerusalem to visit Islamic, Christian, Jewish, and other holy sites. Therefore, again, the people to people relationship is not entirely new news to us. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, His Majesty the King, back in 2002, when Bahrain moved from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy, where today we have a legislature and we have representation uh, from the people, uh, at that point, when drafting the constitution, it was enshrined within it the principles of peaceful coexistence and tolerance. And so it has been a cornerstone in who we are. The DNA of Bahraini people is to live with one another uh, and to move forward in a very harmonious way and to develop an atmosphere where we have fostered um, uh, uh, peaceful relations with one another. Now, when it comes to what has been done so far, when it comes to the courts, a lot has been done. And I think that uh, it's important to note that for many people that have uh, that worked within foreign policy and have witnessed the establishment of relations, uh, this is very different because we consider it as, as a warm peace between our two peoples. And uh, in fact, yes, only yesterday, as an example, our foreign minister, Dr. Abdelatif Al-Zayani, he was head of the first ever official Bahraini delegation to Tel Aviv. And he was uh, greeted by the prime minister, by the Israeli president, and he was there alongside Secretary Pompeo, where the United States has played a very important role in all of this. And so um, what came out of it? Well, there was the announcement of embassies 
that are going to be established in the two countries very soon. There was the announcement of up to 14 flights between the two countries uh, and five cargo flights a week to three different locations. Uh, and there was the announcement of uh, e-visas where people can uh, obtain them very easily. And so uh, working groups have been established. We're looking at a number of industries that uh, the two countries uh, are uh, working towards. Uh, and we share a lot in common. And so I think that in the fields of artificial intelligence, technology, IT, uh, there's a lot that we can do together. Thank you. That, that is a profound and immediate impact and it is truly wonderful to hear. You, you mentioned that the United States played an important part in the process. Mr. Ambassador, would you please discuss why it is important for the United States to be included in this process? The fact of the matter is we have built this strong relationship with the United States and we've fostered it for over a century. And it was important for uh, the U.S. to play an integral role in this because this is an introduction to both the peoples of Bahrain and Israel. There is a difference. Like I stated, we have for many years coexisted with uh, people of the Jewish faith from Bahrain. As a matter of fact, my predecessor, was, uh, and her name is Ambassador Huda Nunu, was the first Arab woman ambassador from Bahrain, uh, from the Arab world to Washington DC, and she was from the Jewish faith. She, uh, before being posted here, she was uh, in, uh, a member of the legislative branch, and, and we have two houses, an appointed house and an elected house. The appointed house was created to make sure that um, uh, there's equal opportunity for, for all to be represented within the legislature. And we always had someone from, we always, we still do have someone from the Jewish faith uh, within the legislature. And she was a member then. Uh, so, and so uh, we have the only synagogue in, in Arabia, uh, an over 80 year old synagogue, uh, but the, with the establishment of relations with the State of Israel, it was important to have uh, a country like the United States that we can uh, all of us work together in order to bring people closer and uh, smoothen out uh, any of the issues, uh, especially in the in the early stages. Uh, we do trust that um, we are off on the right foot. Um, there is a lot of optimism, not only from the Bahraini side, but from the Israeli side as well. Uh, a, a very interesting an anecdote is that the first national carrier flight yesterday landed in Israel and the, uh, uh, the flight number was uh, GF972 which is the, uh, for those that call family uh, and friends in Israel, it's the uh, international code whenever you're calling. And I think that's, that's gonna continue uh, for at least one of the flights. So um, there are, there, like I said, there's a lot going on, a lot of potential, and we're looking forward to building on what has al already been developed in the last couple of weeks. Thank you. We are very proud to have our country play a role in this in this process. Thank you for that that answer. Um, earlier, you mentioned that it had been decades since normalization of relations between uh, Israel and I think it was Jordan was was the last country in 1994. Could you please tell us more about what is unique about this current moment in history that has made these peace agreements possible? The, these peace agreements are uh, uh, very different than uh, the past agreements. Uh, first of all, uh, 
Israel has never fought on the battlefield with Bahrain. Uh, uh, Israel has never been hostile towards Bahrain. They, 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 it's, 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 it's the first thing that comes to mind is when we establish relations with a country uh, that we, first of all, do not have borders with, we do not have a past history with, uh, it just becomes easier going forward. Um, and the other thing is that there were a lot of incidents in the past that, has, that have positioned Bahrain in, in, in a way that makes it easier for the leadership to take a bold decision like um, for the past two decades, we have consistently seen uh, so many different uh, announcements and statements that uh, hinted to the world that this is the direction that we are headed. Uh, our foreign minister, uh, former foreign minister, actually, uh, in 2017, when we hosted the Peace to Prosperity Workshop, which is the economic uh, pillar of the Middle East peace plan that was presented by the United States, uh, our former foreign minister met with Israeli media right in the capital uh, of Bahrain. Uh, he put out a number of tweets and uh, a number of statements on uh, different panels where he uh, described Israel as, as them being uh, uh, part of the heritage of the region. Uh, he also uh, once defended uh, any country having the right to defend itself against any aggression in the region, including the state of Israel. So all of these actions uh, came at a time where Bahrain had not yet established relations with the state of Israel. Um, and so I, I think that we've been moving forward with it for quite some time now. Um, this happened to be the right time. And um, when we are asked about timing, the timing for peace is today. The timing for peace is, is, is now. Um, especially in, uh, in, in, the part, in a part of the world where there is uh, a lot of challenges uh, that our peoples face. Mr. Ambassador, looking back over the entire process, what are you personally most proud of uh, reflecting on that? Honestly, uh, I'm very proud of the overwhelming support we had received in response to our decision to establish relations with Israel. I mean, if we go back to the first instance, um, within the Arab world, there was uh, a, a lot of animosity, a lot of um, negative connotations. Whereas here today, uh, it seems like both, uh, and I speak both domestically uh, and region, uh, and if I may clarify, um, this decision is not an on and off switch for us. Mm -hmm. uh, when our foreign minister was in town, he had to leave on the exact same day uh, to address Congress back home. And uh, because we had announced three weeks after the UAE, we started to see uh, some positive and neutral stances from the people of Bahrain, uh, from the legislature. But then uh, the Speaker of the House, she put out a very positive statement uh, back home. The uh, Chairman of our House Foreign Affairs Committee put out a very positive statement and included, an, in addition to a number of uh, parliamentarians as well. And so we felt that the time was now. And that really was a, a reassuring uh, instance, and it helped us move forward very quickly. And so uh, I think that people back home 
recognize uh, the importance of this step. Uh, regionally, uh, our neighbors we spoke to uh, consulted some of our neighbors. We consulted uh, some of our allies uh, in Europe, and we were always hearing positive statements uh, in, our, in our close meetings. And so uh, we are very happy. Um, we hope that this uh, uh, starts a new trend in the region, a trend that supports peace between the peoples. And especially for those regions where we're looking at a vast majority of young people that have for over a decade now, haven't really been in schools in some of the countries around us. And so what's the future gonna be for, for, for this growing um, uh, youth population? Uh, and so um, I think this, this instills hope within their communities as well, uh, that uh, uh, resolutions can be uh, achieved, but dialogue needs to start somewhere. Thank you. And, and one more question on the Accords. Would you please uh, tell us why the agreements are referred to as the Abraham Accords? Abraham is Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Um, they all come from Abraham. And so uh, I think even in the UAE, uh, they are now uh, undergoing a project where they're building a mosque, a church, and a synagogue close to each other. And uh, they've uh, also used the same title. But uh, it was an idea that came from, a, from one of our friends in the White House, uh, General uh, Miguel Correa, uh, and the National Security Council, uh, he came up with this ingenious uh, title. I think it fits it adequately and uh, it, it, it resonated with a, a lot of people uh, back home. Now, uh, for us in Bahrain, we, we, we cherish this diversity. Uh, we have, for those that haven't visited Bahrain yet, uh, I hope that you do one day because uh, you're gonna see something very different than, uh, than what is sometimes perceived. Uh, in the heart of the capital, you can walk for 10 minutes and pass by a mosque, the synagogue, and one of many uh, Christian churches uh, in, in within uh, a mile or two. And so uh, this just feeds into exactly who we are and uh, it feeds into our national security as well. Th that is just beautiful and so inclusive. Uh, thank you so much for that, that answer and explanation. Um, I have a, a different question for you now. We have many students attending your presentation today who are interested in careers relating to international business. Mr. Ambassador, what skills and competencies will help them succeed in today's global economy? Uh, I think you, you nicely closed out the question with, with uh, global economy. It truly is a global economy. Um, it, it's interesting to see how commerce has really shifted, especially in light of the pandemic. And all of a sudden, a country like ours that has been shifting from, uh, the government has been shifting from an operator to a regulator. We have been opening up markets. We have been supplying loans and funds to SMEs and promoting entrepreneurship. Uh, here we are today uh, when, when governments do the right thing. In this instance, it's a free trade agreement. We are opening up our markets for each other. It becomes so much easier for entrepreneurs, for SMEs to use these platforms in order to uh, increase commerce between the two nations. And I think that uh, as time goes by, 
we will see uh, different purchasing patterns, we'll see uh, more opportunities, and technology is, is definitely enabling us to uh, reach a, a bigger target audience. Not only is it doing that, but with artificial intelligence today, uh, sky is the limit, and it's becoming cheaper with time. And I think that uh, uh, for those that are thinking of uh, majoring in, 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 in global uh, trade, um, the, the sky's the limit. So. Thank you. Uh, could you please tell us more about your personal background in your path to becoming an ambassador? Here's the thing. I, I've never planned for this to happen. Uh, and this is the honest truth. Uh, I took things uh, ever since graduating from university, I knew that I wanted to become a public servant. And that's why I joined the General Organization for Youth and Sports. And I worked very closely with uh, community members. Uh, and I, I gained a lot of, uh, uh, of experience there. But it was truly when, when I was appointed as a, as a governor is when I got to work uh, with the constituents, when I got to work as a, as, a, as a mediator between government policies and the outlook of, uh, of, of the population that I used to serve. And so that was always in the back of my mind. How can I play a part in creating a better quality of life for individuals that are living in Bahrain, be they Bahrainis or non-Bahrainis, um, because we have uh, an, a huge number of uh, expats that have chosen to live in Bahrain and we pride ourselves uh, in them choosing to live amongst us. And so uh, I think that it is important to have goals. It is important to, uh, to look at different opportunities. Uh, I think that the reason why I was appointed here in the United States was, uh, first of all, uh, knowing the culture, knowing the people. Uh, I, I got to, um, to know the United States out of class more than uh, or equally as much as when I was in class. Um, it was uh, a, 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 a truly um, uh, invigorating experience. But uh, at the same time, you look at uh, you look at things as, as they develop and you try to become a more balanced individual. Uh, meaning if there are things that you still kind of shy away from, you have to, uh, you have to approach them. You have to, uh, you have to try, even if you fail once or twice, uh, at the end of the day, you will gain experience and you will gain confidence with time. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. In reading your biography, and you mentioned just a little bit of it just now, um, I noticed you completed much of your higher education in the United States. Uh, would you please describe what the experience has been like for you? Again, I think it, uh, it, it truly opened up my eyes to, uh, to the possibilities. Um, I went to school in Boston. Um, I kept in touch with a lot of the people that I went to school uh, with. And uh, I sort of saw a, a, a different uh, America than what I had in mind before coming. Um, now, when it's, it's very different when you're here at a younger age. Uh, and I, I, can, I can say that from first-hand experience with, with my, my, my daughters and my boys as they grow up. My eldest is 16, my youngest is four. And um, for them to be within the educational system here in the United States, um, I've, I've really seen a shift 
not only in, uh, in the education level, because the education level back home is really good. Um, I mean, the first, my freshman year, I, it was just very easy because I, I, I took all of that in school and then it started becoming more difficult. But it's what you learn from the people, it's what you learn from experiences that uh, that's really count. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I, I wanna let you know uh, what a thrill it, it, it was for me personally to be able to have this discussion with you today. Um, I've learned so much and I hope we can host you in San Diego someday, that would be a thrill. I will get to Bahrain someday after hearing you, you talk about it. Uh, it's especially uh, exciting. Um, I, I would like to ask you, do you have any closing remarks that you would like to make uh, before we bring this event to an end today? Well, Dean Renning, uh, first of all, let me, let me thank everyone for joining uh, us today. Let me thank those that uh, made this event possible. Um, and if I may leave on, uh, on a positive note, because 2020 was a year that a lot of people want to uh, forget. Uh, it, it was uh, tough on governments. It was tough on households. It was tough on students adapting to this new uh, way of life. Um, but there's always optimism. And there's always uh, an opposite side of the coin here. Um, I wouldn't have been able to, uh, to be with you as easily as I am here today. Uh, commerce has, again, really changed the way in which uh, we operate our lives. And it, if we continue to see um, the positive elements of whatever comes our way, uh, we'll definitely become uh, stronger as we grow up and as we move forward. Thank you. You, you certainly have highlighted today one of the great accomplishments of, of 2020, and it's so nice uh, to, to have that discussion with you. But thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. It has really been uh, a privilege. I also want to thank uh, Mrs. Chenye Hosler for her vision in making this event possible. And thank you, President Adala De La Torre for hosting this lecture series and partnering with the Hostler Institute. And finally, thank all of you for attending today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this event and uh, will join us for additional events in the future. Thank you.